I'm going to start this episode off with an amendment, because there was one thing I forgot to change last time, which someone pointed out, so thank you for that. On the 1st of November 1942, Kempf was replaced as commander of the 48th Panzer Corps by General Heim of the 14th Panzer Division. I haven't found out the reason why this happened, but it did, and I forgot to change it, so sorry about that. Also, General Lieutenant Hans Freiherr von Falkenstein took over the 14th Panzer Division for the time being. Anyway, on the 11th of November 1942, Paulus launched what would be his fifth and final assault to capture Stalingrad. It didn't go well. Zverin's forces were first battered by Soviet artillery before they fired their own, and when they advanced from Hall 3 into Hall 4, they were hit by machine gun fire, pinned, and forced to withdraw. Another force did reach the hall, but instantly got bogged down inside the ruins, and the commander of yet another unit was killed, forcing the assault to fall back. By the end of the day, zero ground had been taken, at a cost of over 70 German casualties. The 179th Pioneer Battalion had lost 54 of its original 120 men, and this had only been a diversionary attack, the main attack struck to the north. Due to bad weather though, the Stukas were unable to assist at first, so German artillery, rocket and mortar fire hit the Soviet positions at 0340 hours, and 15 minutes later, the 305th and 389th Infantry Divisions advanced. They were immediately embroiled in a desperate firefight for what was, in essence, a few buildings. The southern regiments managed to capture the pharmacy, but stalled outside the commissar's house, which the pioneers found difficult to break into because the windows and doors were blocked by rubble. The commissar's house was an impressive multi-storey building that was more like a fortress than a house. And the reason why the Germans called it the commissar's house, even though it was actually the admin building for the barricade factory, was because the 62nd Army's 77th Blocking Detachment, in other words, a bunch of commissars, were positioned inside the building. Soviet small arms fire pinned the Germans there and kept them from taking it, and the Stugs of 244th Sturmgeschütz Battalion had to be brought in to fire at the building and deploy smoke to get their pinned guys out of harm's way. But after the inexperienced crews accidentally went the wrong way, three Stugs were taken out, including two of the new versions, as the Soviets deployed anti-tank rifles and Molotov cocktails to destroy the ones that had strayed too close. In other words, it was a disaster. But while the attack in the middle had failed, the attack near the fuel tanks was successful. The 241st Rifle Regiment was all but wiped out, the fuel depot fell into German hands, and German troops reached the Volga, trapping Ludikov's troops in a pocket. And to the north, the 546th Infantry Regiment, spearheaded by the 45th and 162nd Pioneer Battalions, captured several blocks of buildings, while the 544th Infantry Regiment with the 389th Pioneer Battalion did the same. These encircled elements of the 118th Rifle Regiment in another smaller pocket slightly north of Ludnikov's main pocket. At this point, all Chirikov could offer in assistance to Ludnikov was artillery fire, which pounded the German units, allowing the remnants of the 138th Rifle Division to hold the line. By the end of the day, though, around 2,000 Soviet soldiers were trapped in a pocket that was then nicknamed Ludnikov's Island, as well as a small pocket nearby. Ludnikov was wounded in the fighting, and he had lost 355 men from the 1,288 men he had started with. Even more shocking, the 241st Rifle Regiment had lost between 90 and 117% of its strength in the fighting. Jason DeMarc reports that it had lost 400 men out of 340. Not sure how that works, but ICF says there were still about 40 or 50 men left in the regiment. And another 100 men had been lost in the 161st Rifle Regiment, bringing the total Soviet casualties in the area to around 855. 
Chubikov's army was also now split again, and actually in four pieces this time. Group Gorokov in the north, the 118th Rifle Regiment, Ludnikov's Island, as it was known, and the rest of the army to the south. But to do this, the cost for the Germans had been heavy. Ten out of the 28 Stugs that took part in the attack were knocked out, although some were repairable, and the 305th Infantry Division had suffered 13 dead and 119 wounded for what was little more than a few buildings. The 389th Infantry Division itself only lost 2 killed and 13 wounded, but the two attached Pioneer Battalions and the assault troops from the 24th Panzer Division brought the total to 48 killed, 152 wounded, and 180 missing, highlighting just how vulnerable Pioneers were without sufficient infantry support. A total of 146 men had been killed, 545 wounded, and another 181 missing, just in this area alone. The pioneers that had been brought in had numbered 1,753 men and had suffered 440 casualties, a 25% casualty rate on their first day. Horrendous losses compared to the ground taken. As quoted in Jason DeMarc's book, Island of Fire, Major Linden, who had been in overall charge of the Pioneers, explains that because the Pioneers had had to scramble over the rubble of Stalingrad with their bulky equipment, they often had to leave their infantry weapons and ammunition behind. Concentrating on the obstacles rather than the enemy made them easy prey for Soviet riflemen, and when they took ground, they had to wait for the infantry to catch up, which they were often slow to do. So the pioneers were forced to defend themselves like infantrymen without the weapons and ammunition needed to do so. They therefore sometimes lost ground that they had previously taken. If you're looking for an even more detailed account of this period of the fighting than I can give you here, you know, right down to almost individual level, the Nine Island of Fire is the book you really need to get. Major Linden spoke to Zylitz, saying that a fresh infantry regiment, at least, needed to be brought up to reinforce the pioneers. But Zylitz responded by saying that the Soviets had brought up large motorized formations at the Don opposite the Axis Allied armies, and therefore all spare infantry was being sent there. This is interesting, considering what Geelan and the others were saying at the time, which we'll be hearing about shortly. Even more intriguing is that 14th Panzer Division said it had 3,000 drivers on the 11th of November 1942, and were of the opinion that if they received more engines, they could get an additional 50 Panzers operational. Yes, 3,000 drivers, all consuming food and other resources, but being completely useless out here at the end of a long logistical chain. Considering also that the 6th Army's Quartermaster reported on this day that a supply crisis was soon possible, it seems almost ludicrous that there were 3,000 idle hands sat about doing nothing at this time. Could they not be sent back to Germany? Also, the fact that there was a supply crisis, it seems unlikely that they would receive the engines they needed, so they had a bunch of drivers and a bunch of tanks that were sitting at Stalingrad doing nothing. A complete waste. Speaking of panzers, Kampfgruppe Schieler from 24th Panzer Division was able to launch a quick attack to retake Hall 10. The Soviets tried to counterattack and were repulsed, so the Germans were able to regain their former positions for the loss of 12 killed and 26 wounded. Paulus therefore informed his superiors that the attack was a partial success, which is a dubious claim since he himself was disappointed by the result. He decided to regroup his forces the next day, the 12th, and continue the attack on the 13th of November. Zylitz sent out the necessary orders and wanted trenches dug by prisoners of war up to and along the front line so that the Germans could move up to it without exposing themselves to fire. Clearly, he was trying to prevent needless casualties. Chuikov, on the other hand, decided to bring across the Volga two battalions from the 92nd Rifle Brigade and the 90th Regiment from 95th Rifle Division in preparation for another offensive action. He wanted to break the encirclement of the 138th Rifle Division. 
He had time to do this because, despite Chirikov claiming otherwise, Zeidlitz was compelled to pause to reorganize his forces on the 12th of November. The Germans did conduct small probes and raids to improve their positions, and it appears that they wiped out the 118th Rifle Regiment's pocket, of which only six men, of the 250 that had been trapped inside of it, made it out alive, but otherwise the line didn't move. Churikov, though, was adamant that they did attack. The attack came at noon that day. Fighting fled up along the whole of the army's front. German soldiers, drunk or mad, came on and on. The Germans' desperate attack came to a halt on the evening of November 12th. The Germans' attacks on that day had been beaten off on all sectors occupied by the army. German losses in these two days of fighting were colossal, running into thousands. In fact, the opposite was true. Churikov launched his own attacks, focusing on defeating the German corridor on the Volga and linking up with Lunikov's forces. Throwing into battle a battalion of marines from the Pacific Fleet. Yes, apparently the 3rd Battalion of 92nd Rifle Brigade were a bunch of marines from the Pacific Fleet. The fuel tanks changed hands several times, but ultimately remained in German possession. 3rd Marine Battalion ended the day with just 15 men left. In other words, it was wiped out. 241st Regiment was down to 23 men, and the 161st Regiment had 235 men. So, despite the reinforcements, Churikov's line was on the brink, and he had no chance of breaking through to Ludnikov. Churikov later claimed in his memoirs that he had no knowledge of the upcoming offensive. Yet his willingness to throw his men into counterattacks at this point indicates that he did know. We also have contemporary evidence that the intention of these counterattacks was actually to prevent the Germans from withdrawing troops to protect their flanks. But by pretending that he didn't know, he could claim that his reckless and costly counterattacks were justified on tactical grounds, when in reality they really weren't. The only reason these were going in was to keep the Germans occupied. In other words, they were a waste of lives. Smekotvorov was allowed to withdraw his divisional and regimental staff across the Volga, leaving a composite regiment behind that was subordinate to the 95th Rifle Division. And Churikov ordered the 1043rd Regiment from Batyuk's division to relieve the left wing of the 112th Regiment, reinforcing the line at the Red October factory. Still, Churikov had inflicted serious losses on the Germans. The 6th Army reported that its 12 infantry divisions had suffered more than 12,000 casualties in October and had been short by roughly 74,000 men on the 1st of November. Losses suffered primarily by the fighting elements of those divisions, not the drivers of 14th Panzer Division. Of these 12 divisions, 5 of them had suffered 75% of the casualties, meaning that most of the casualties had been sustained inside the city of Stalingrad. Outside the city, von Weichs now ordered Paulus to give him 10,000 men from his pioneer and artillery units so that he could place them behind the Romanians at the Don. Paulus had already pledged on the 11th to send a few battalions to the left flank of his army and had acknowledged that the Soviets were building up forces on both the southern and Don flanks. Vikes considered moving the 29th Motorized Division as well, but Hot was of the opinion that an attack was coming his way, so it didn't happen. And this is interesting, considering that Geelan's intelligence reports barely mentioned the Soviet build-up south of Stalingrad, which Falk describes as a clear failure to determine the true scope of the planned Russian offensive. We must expect an early attack against the Romanian Third Army, with the interruption of our railroad to Stalingrad as its objective, so as to endanger all German forces farther to the east and compel our forces in Stalingrad to withdraw. So, Galen believed that the upcoming operation wasn't aiming to encircle the 6th Army. He thought it was only designed to compel it to withdraw. Also, as his next comments make clear, he wasn't sure what the overall objective was. Was it Stalingrad? Or was it Rostov? 
At present, it is still unclear whether we can expect a large-scale offensive across the Don against the Italian 8th and Hungarian 2nd armies, with Rostov as the objective, which, in terms of time, would follow after the operations against the Romanian 3rd Army, or whether the enemy, along with an offensive against the Romanian 3rd Army, would undertake offensive operations with limited objectives against the Italian 8th and Hungarian 2nd Armies. To all appearances, the testimony of one captured officer who designated the Morozovsk Stalingrad Road as the objective of the offensive confirms this tonight. Morozovsk is here, and the road in question runs to Kalach and onto Stalingrad. You'd think if this road was the objective, and that the attacking force was coming through 3rd Romanian Army, Gielin would put two and two together, that the ultimate objective was the encirclement of the 6th Army, but apparently not. He was still wondering if Rostov was the objective. Zhukov had set the date for Operation Uranus for the 15th of November, so it was only a matter of time before Gielin found out the truth, although the start date depended on whether the Soviets could bring up enough supplies in time. So yes, would Gielin finally figure this all out? Would the Germans be able to react in time to the Soviet build-up? Let's find out. Too weak to conduct a major offensive, on the 13th of November 1942, Zeidlitz decided to focus on one part of the battlefield, Lunikov's Island. He therefore detached the 162nd Pioneer Battalion from the 389th Infantry Division and assigned it to Steinmetz's division. He then ordered Steinmetz to use it to reinforce his 578th Regiment's assault on the Commissar's house. The problem with this area was that it was largely flat, with dugouts along the cliff at the Volga. From these dugouts, the Soviets could offer decent direct fire against the Germans as they assaulted the various buildings, and could call in artillery from the opposite bank as well. Therefore, the Germans were going to have a lot of trouble destroying Ludnikov, who was determined to hold on at all costs. At 03.45 hours, Steinmetz's forces began their assault from the pharmacy and nearby buildings, pushing along the riverside cliff of the Volga. The 650th Regiment was caught off guard and had to improvise a defence in one of the buildings and on the cliffs. Burrowed into the sides of the ravine where Lunikov's remnants held on, four men, known to their comrades as the Rolik Group, challenged the German pioneers. When the Germans hung over the steep embankment and let down satchel charges of dynamite, the Rolik men snipped the wires dangling in front of them and the explosives dropped into the Volga. Ludnikov's headquarters in the Red House was attacked by German pioneers and submachine gunners, but with a swift counterattack made up of some staff members, engineers and a female medical assistant, all led by Ludnikov himself, the Soviets stabilised the situation. Panzers, assault guns and artillery pounded the Commissar's house, wiping out the Soviets on the upper floor. The German pioneers and grenadiers of Sturm Company 44 dashed inside the U-shape of the building and blew a hole to break into it. They secured the staircase and made their way up to the top floors, which they quickly secured. Now above the Soviet defenders, they used grenades and flamethrowers to blast, burn and smoke them out. The Soviets fought back, firing from gaps in the walls, and retreated to the cellar, where they requested their own artillery and mortars to fire on their own position. Holes were blasted in the floorboards, allowing the Germans to employ their flamethrowers and throw down satchel charges and smoke grenades. After resisting for a while longer, nine wounded and burnt Soviet soldiers fled the building and escaped back to their own lines, where only two of them were fit enough to keep fighting. It took all day, but the building was finally in German hands. Horrifyingly, a tunnel that lay beneath the building had been used as a makeshift hospital. The entrance to the tunnel collapsed, sealing the wounded inside. The Germans didn't know about the tunnel, and it was only decades later that the tunnel was rediscovered, with skeletons, weapons and equipment discovered still in it. 
the 577th Regiment, the 336th Pioneer Battalion, and more grenadiers from the 44th Sturm Company assaulted the 344th Regiment's positions, trying to take the houses west of the Commissar's house. The Germans threw grenades and jumped into the positions of 344th Regiment's mortar batteries, engaging them in vicious hand-to-hand -hand combat. The mortars had already previously been destroyed, so the pits were occupied by Soviet men with rifles who fought back and repelled the assault. A couple of buildings were taken, and part of the park that was north of the Commissar House also fell into German hands, but otherwise the 344th Regiment had stopped the Germans. The Germans had failed to wipe out Lunikov's men, and the cost had been high once more. At 0900 hours, the Soviets launched a counterattack near the oil tanks. Lacking ammunition and food, the composite regiment of the 193rd Rifle Division nonetheless threw itself several times against the 576th Regiment and 305th Infantry Division, attempting to tie down as many German forces as possible and break through to Lunikov. Chirikov ordered his arriving 90th Rifle Regiment and 92nd Rifle Brigade, which had been reinforced, to repel any new enemy attacks and to stabilise the situation near the 193rd's Composite Regiment. Ammunition supplies were running out though, with only a day's supply remaining for the entire army. Glantz explains that, while 62nd Army's paper strength was 47,000 men, most of this was on the eastern bank of the Volga, and those on the West Bank were probably only around 8,000 men. Chirikov therefore desperately needed saving, and Operation Uranus would be what rescued him, although there was a problem. Zhukov and Vasilevsky went to see Stalin in Moscow and explained that delays in supplying the troops meant that an attack could not start before the 19th of November. Stalin approved, and the necessary orders were sent to the front commanders. So, even though it was delayed, Operation Uranus was given the green light. And that evening, the OKW reported that the Romanians had repelled several small enemy attacks south of Stalingrad and along the Don Front. They concluded that an attack was incoming, but believed it would be easily repelled, much like previous attacks had been. On this day, a Ju-88 reconnaissance plane found a mile-long column of Soviet tanks north of the Don Bend, which was part of the Soviet 5th Tank Army. Then, early on the 14th of November, Geelan's Foreign Army's East Intelligence Service reported that there was more evidence of forces gathering in the south against the Romanian 6th Army Corps, and that there was a possibility of an attack. Gielan also said that they had spotted the 6th Guards Cavalry Division in the area east of Serafimovich, and that the 21st Cavalry Division had appeared in the area opposite Romanian 1st Army Corps. The report therefore concluded that the 3rd Guards and 8th Cavalry Corps, the parent formations of the two divisions, must have moved into this region. Richthofen could also see that the Soviets were concentrating at the Don, and even sent two flak battalions to the Romanians to boost their anti-tank capabilities. Meanwhile, the 64th Army mounted a surprise attack in the south. The 96th Rifle Brigade managed to penetrate the 371st Infantry Division's defences in the southern part of Kuporoznaya. Paulus quickly ordered Kampfgruppe Schieler of 24th Panzer Division to release 10 of its 20 tanks and support the 71st Infantry Division's 211th Regiment. The reinforced 211th Regiment was then ordered to move to the southern suburb of Minina before moving south to reinforce 371st Infantry Division's defences. Back inside the city, Zeidlitz launched another attack. Steinmetz employed the right wing of the 577th Regiment, with two companies of 336th Pioneer Battalion supported by 23 assault guns of 244th and 245th Assault Gun Battalions as the spearhead. This force attacked east from Halls 3 and 4 in the Barricade Factory, striking the right wing of the 344th Rifle Regiment. Meanwhile, the 44th Storm Company attacked the 650th Regiment, with Steinmetz slowly pushing his way through the narrow strip of ground between the Commissar's house and the Volga. 
The Soviet force facing them was less than half the German strength, but resisted strongly in their hundreds of strong points in the rubble. By nightfall, they had barely gone anywhere, just a few metres, and Ludnikov's men held on, now reduced to a little more than 500 men, and almost without food or ammunition. At the end of the day, 344th Rifle Regiments only had enough cartridges and grenades left for one day of fighting. The same applied for rations. 138th Rifle Division had used up most of its supplies, so increasing use was to be made of those captured from the Germans. The 62nd Army reported that the Volga ice was preventing many of the boats from making the crossing, causing acute shortages of ammunition and food, and preventing reinforcements from crossing. Chirikov was happy he had requisitioned 12 tons of chocolate for just such an emergency. If the Volga failed to freeze over soon, he figures a ration of half a bar a day for each man could mean they're holding out for two weeks longer. Krylov reported that Chirikov even asked for more chocolate and ammunition to be dropped by aircraft. Yes, the Soviets were so close to destruction that they were relying on rations of chocolate. On the 15th, Zeilitz ordered his men to attack again, but by this point, the Germans had only enough strength to attack one building at a time. The 6th Army was reduced to fighting for individual buildings, showing just how ridiculous this battle had become. Thus, the 578th Regiment, supported by what was left of the 50th Pioneer Battalion and a handful of assault guns, struck the 650th Regiment north of the Commissar's house. The shells from the new stocks were effective in destroying the Soviet positions, and the Germans took a couple of buildings after some brutal fighting. The 546th Regiment, supported by the 45th Pioneer Battalion and the 44th Sturm Company, and 10 assault guns also advanced towards the Red House. They didn't reach it, however, because Soviet resistance was fierce. German casualties for the day were 16 men killed, 44 wounded and 15 missing, all for a few buildings. But Ludnikov had lost 64 killed and 137 wounded. The 768th Rifle Regiment was classed as being incapable of combat, and the 650th Rifle Regiment was down to 31 men, which included its commander. The 344th Rifle Regiment also only had 123 men. Lunikov reported, Ammunition 20 to 30 rounds per rifle. There was no grenades or PP Shah submachine gun ammunition. The personnel of the division received one meal. The food has been completely used up. 250 wounded are located at the command post of the division. Chirikov was so desperate that he asked Yeremenka to provide support for 138th Rifle Division from the units on Zaitsev Island. Perhaps they could give ammunition and evacuate the wounded. He also had no choice but to throw 685th Regiment with just 258 men at the German lines over and over in order to keep the Germans distracted from Ludnikov's forces. Our counterattacks, it is true, did not restore the position, but neither was the enemy able to wipe out Ludnikov's division. On the night of November 15th, our night flying aircraft dropped four bales of provisions and four of ammunition to Ludnikov. This was actually confirmed by the German reports. In the afternoon of the 15th, we were surprised. Two Soviet airplanes circled over the position near the Commissar's house at low altitude. Suddenly, they dropped something that did not look like bombs at all. They were sacks, of which part also fell in our sector. They contained bread and meat, so the misery of the encircled troops must have been great. We were cheered by this and hoped for an imminent complete success. Jason DeMarc reports that the target area, Ludnikov's Island, was so small that the parachute bags drifted with the wind into the German areas or into the Volga. More were dropped onto the German areas because they lit their own signal flares to indicate where to drop supplies. Worse, the bags and crates were sometimes dropped without parachutes, bending some of the cartridges and rendering them useless. As a result, Ludnikov decided that resupplying his forces by air was no longer worth the effort. 
With Operation Uranus just hours away now, Stalin paced back and forth in his office, puffing on his pipe and listening to Zhukov and Vasilevsky talk. He had received a warning from the commander of the 4th Mechanized Corps, General Volsky, stating that, as an honest communist, he had to inform the Premier that a lack of manpower and equipment would doom the Red Army's coming attack. Zhukov and Vasilevsky had to defend their plans and preparations, after which Stalin called Volsky. Without any show of anger, he, Stalin, reassured the general that the offensive had been properly conceived. While Zhukov and Vasilevsky listened in amazement, Stalin cordially accepted Volsky's apologies and hung up. Perhaps even more shocking was that Stalin told Zhukov, if the thought occurs to you for Operation Uranus to begin one or two days earlier or later, I authorize you to decide that matter at your own discretion. Falk comments, This message is unbelievable because Stalin was permitting General Zhukov to shift the date of the Great Offensive at his own discretion. This would have been unthinkable even as little as six months before. Stalin clearly was much more at ease in allowing senior Red Army commanders to perform their duties without undue scrutiny. Anthony Beaver, though, is somewhat skeptical of all this. The possibility cannot be ruled out that this, the Volsky telegram and phone call, was a precautionary ploy to be used by Stalin against Zhukov and Vasilevsky in case Operation Uranus failed. On the 16th of November, Lensky received orders from the 6th Army at 2200 hours to prepare his division for quick extraction, with the possibility of being used for counterattacks and mobile defence. The 14th Panzer Division, now under the command of General Lieutenant Johannes Beisler, also received similar orders. So, at a time when they should have been finishing off Chirikov's last remnants, their forces were preparing to pull out of the city and be sent west. It's no surprise then that Richthofen expressed his frustration at the 6th Army's poor performance, telling Zeitzler to find energetic combat leadership at Stalingrad or call off the attack. He said that if they couldn't win now with ice blocking the Volga, then they would never take it. Zeitzler agreed and promised to take it up with the Führer. Richthofen was of the opinion, though, that Zeitzler didn't have the guts to remove Paulus or the other commanders at Stalingrad. Hmm. What do you think? Was Richthofen right? Should Paulus have been removed? Let me know in the comments below. On the 16th of November 1942, the first proper snow fell on the city of Stalingrad, blanketing the ruins and the unburied corpses. Paulus and Zeilitz were convinced that the only way to progress now would be to rest, refit, reorganize, and reinforce 51st Army Corps units. So, this is what they did for the next three days. They planned on resuming their assaults on the 20th of November, meaning that they had failed, because obviously Operation Uranus would be launched on the 19th of November. So there's no chance now for Paulus to win this. Chirikov has accomplished his mission, if he hadn't done so earlier, which he definitely did, but this is now confirmation. That being said, Steinmetz continued to launch local attacks against Lunikov's division in order to establish better jump-off positions for the 20th, which meant that there was still a chance for Lunikov's diehards to get wiped out. Although, this was looking doubtful as Lunikov began to receive much-needed supplies, some dropped by aircraft, others coming via ferries that had dodged the ice now flooding the Volga. They were forced to rely on German weapons to keep firing though, so just a few more days could spell victory for either Steinmetz or Ludnikov. It all depended on who could bring up more men and supplies. On the 17th of November, not a lot happened on Lunikov's island, with both sides just shelling and prodding each other. The 305th Infantry Division, though, did receive 1,000 replacements from a March battalion, which was a major threat to Lunikov. However, there were few NCOs among the new recruits, and the training of these replacements hadn't been adequate. They had to be split up among the combat troops and given on-the-job combat experience, which caused casualties and stressed out the survivors. 
Some fled. One turned his weapon on the others and had to be disarmed. The 90th Regiment finally managed to reinforce its parent 95th Rifle Division. After an artillery bombardment, it launched another attack at 11.30 hours, taking the oil tanks relatively quickly. Both sides, however, sustained heavy casualties, bringing the Soviets to a halt and preventing the Germans from taking the lost ground. The Soviets had failed to get through to Lunikov's men. And to the north, the 16th Panzer Division launched another attack on Renok, hoping to throw Group Gorokov back into the Volga. In the middle of a snowstorm, 16th Motorcycle Battalion and the 2nd Battalion of 79th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, supported by 25 Panzers, plus the 276th Infantry Regiment from the 94th Infantry Division, assaulted the Soviet lines. 276 regiments went nowhere, while 16th Panzer Division did manage to get into the village of Renok itself before a Soviet sniper took out the leader of one of the German battalions, halting the attack. Then the Soviets struck back, apparently with four tanks, according to the Germans, although that seems doubtful, and forced the Germans to retreat to the edges of the village. 16th Panzer Division took 122 casualties. Yet, Paulus ordered the division to continue its attacks on the 18th. Why? Probably because Hitler sent this message to Paulus at 13.15 hours. Announce the following order verbally to all commanders from army down to regiment fighting in Stalingrad inclusively. I am aware of the difficulties in the fighting in Stalingrad and of the decline in combat strengths, but the drift ice on the Volga poses even greater difficulties to the Russians. If we exploit this time span, we will save ourselves much blood later. I therefore expect that the leadership and the troops will once more, as they often have in the past, devote their energy and spirit to at least getting through to the Volga at the gun factory and the metallurgical plant and taking these sections of the city. The Air Force and the artillery must do all in their power to prepare and support this offensive. But, considering that the flanks were under threat, Paulus was having to pull troops away from the city. To the south, the 371st Infantry Division's Reserve Force, including panzers from the 24th Panzer Division, counterattacked and forced the 96th Rifle Brigade to retreat to its original positions. And the Soviets received a stroke of luck when heavy fog on this day kept the Luftwaffe grounded. This was perfect timing, because their forces were most vulnerable and easily spotted as they moved into their final assault positions, which is what they were doing now. Finally, just two days before the offensive was to begin, Soviet divisional and regimental commanders were being briefed on their mission, with the troops finding out shortly afterwards. We were now just hours away from the start of the offensive, and Hitler was still concerning himself with a couple of buildings inside Stalingrad. Really, it was too late for that. On the eve of the Great Soviet Offensive, the 6th Army wasn't the only thing at the end of its tether. So was its commander. Paulus was under heavy strain. His doctor warned him that he was heading for a breakdown if he continued without a rest. The alarming reports arriving at army headquarters were growing. Our nerves were stretched to breaking point. There was no doubt that the Soviet offensive was imminent. What would happen if the 11th Corps and the Romanian 3rd Army failed to hold their positions? The long shadow of the Soviet counteroffensive really puts into perspective the impotent actions going on inside the city itself. The attack at Renok bogged down almost instantly on the 18th and just stopped. It seemed that only reinforcements would allow the attack to resume, but they weren't coming. The operation against Renok had failed. Gorokov had survived. Zylitz continued to reorganize his forces for the coming assault on the 20th, and such was the state of German forces that, on the 18th, they only managed to capture one house in Lunikov's sector, and in order to do this, they had to use a Kampfgruppe consisting of the 578th Regiment, the 50th and 162nd Engineer Battalions, a squadron of panzers from the 24th Panzer Division, and some assault guns. Their attack began at 0400 hours and lasted until the light faded in the evening, with the debilitated 650th Regiment making the Germans pay for every inch of ground. Dawn until dusk, all for one house and a little bit 
of the bank of the Volga. It's just, just insane when you think about it. Now, in Jason DeMarc's book, Island of Fire, he explains that there was an incident on this day which has since sparked controversy. One of the Germans, who has been a decent source otherwise, said that he witnessed Soviet commissars in the Ludnikov Island area shooting their own men as they retreated from an attack. A few days ago, we observed wild shooting across the Russians' territory. To begin with, we could make no sense of it or what it meant. Then we began to understand. Some Russians wanted to retreat from the front line. They were simply gunned down by their commissars who were in position behind them. On top of this, a cannon bombarded them from across the Volga, whirling and hurling their corpses grotesquely about in the air. This approach is, of course, effective. Their tough resistance is thus explained. There is obviously no mention of this incident in the Soviet sources, but Jason DeMarc points out that there was a blocking detachment behind the 650th Rifle Regiment's lines. We even know its commander, and the German source is currently viewed as a reliable one. Rettenmeyer had an observation post in the area that would have given him a good view of the incident in question. However, there are several counter-arguments, including this one. The situation of the division became more difficult, even catastrophic. There was no food as before, there was no ammunition, and we had less than half of our combat load of rifle bullets. Our radios did not operate, therefore it became impossible to summon the fires of our artillery from the left bank of the Volga. They didn't have the ammunition spare to shoot their own men, or fire warning shots above their heads as what happened in other situations. And they also didn't have the capability of ordering their artillery to strike their own men, or corpses in this case. It also makes no sense why they would choose to fire artillery at their own corpses. We don't know how many men it was. Rettenmeyer just says some Russians wanted to retreat, so it could be one or two men, maybe a squad or something like that. We also know that some of the Soviet soldiers were compelled to wear German uniforms because of the cold and the lack of supplies coming across the ice-blocked Volga. It may have actually happened, but if it did, it was a local retreat by maybe a half a dozen or so Soviet soldiers who, let's say, may have been wearing German uniforms. The blocking detachment probably mistook them for Germans or Hiwis, fired their own weapons at them, called in artillery against the enemy attack, a few of their guys got killed, and then the artillery shots came in to pound the corpses after it was realised that these guys were on their side. In other words, it was a mistake. I've come to this conclusion because they wouldn't have wasted their depleted ammunition supplies on their own men, especially since they didn't have many men or bullets to spare on Lunikov's island it's likely that they genuinely thought that there were enemy troops coming at them. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but friendly fire is a candidate worth considering. Either way, the setup is not like it was in the film Enemy at the Gates, where thousands of fresh troops are shown running and getting gunned down by their commissars. Lunikov simply didn't have the men or the ammo to do that. There was probably more men in that scene in Enemy at the Gates than Ludikov had left, so let's not imagine anything quite like that, please. But regardless of friendly fire or not, Ludikov's troops had survived, and together with the other survivors of Churikov's army, they had succeeded in doing what was needed. They had not only held on inside Stalingrad, but by doing so, they had weakened Paulus's 6th Army to the point that it barely had the strength to take a building on the last day before the Soviet counteroffensive. Speaking of which, on this day, Soviet artillery guns along the Don and south of Stalingrad fired a few rounds each in order to figure out where their shots were falling. By doing so, this allowed them to adjust their guns appropriately for more accurate fire when the main bombardment began. This was a major indication that an attack was about to begin, and should have warned the axis of the impending offensive. 
As we have seen, some in the German camp didn't think an offensive was coming, or if they did, they only realised at the 11th hour and didn't fully grasp the Soviet intentions. Others saw that an offensive was coming, but dismissed it, thinking it was doomed to failure like many of the other offensives had been. This meant that they were totally unprepared to meet it when it came. Could they react in time though? Would the Romanian lines hold? Could the Germans find enough reserves to support them? And just how successful would the Soviet offensive be? We'll find out in the future. Thanks for watching, bye for now.